Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be right after the meditation. I hope everyone is jazzed up for some data observability. Um, my name is Barr. I'm the founder and CEO of Monte Carlo. Um, and in the next 10 minutes, I'll do a very brief walkthrough of what is data observability and why you should care about it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why I think it's the next frontier of data engineering, um, why the best data teams are adopting these best practices um, around data, data observability, and what it actually looks like in the wild. I'll show you all some examples. Um, so hopefully leave you here with a couple of uh, sort of practical tips that you can take and implement, um, or just learn a little bit more about what data observability is. So just a little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, Monte Carlo is a data reliability company. Um, so we actually help companies trust their data by minimize what we call data downtime. Um, before founding Monte Carlo, I served as VP at a company called Gainsight, uh, the customer data company. Um, my background is in math and stats, um, and I'm a huge fan of Bruce uh, Willis movies. Um, so I've watched them all multiple times. Um, happy to take any answers about any questions about that. Um, so now that we've gotten the important things out of the way, let's talk about data observability. Um, so I actually start by introducing sort of a pain point or a common story that might have happened to you if you had anything to do with data. Um, so, you know, a story about myself, this was uh, several years ago, um, I was responsible for the data and analytics team. Um, and we're responsible for some key data that our executives and our company were relying on to make some important decisions, uh, both day-to-day -day decisions, operational decisions, and also strategic decisions, like where are we going to take our product and which customer segments should we, um, should we work with? And, you know, it felt like literally every Monday morning, I would start sort of the the week, uh, you know, commute into the office uh, back in the day um, and actually would be sort of hit with this wave of things that were wrong with the data. Um, and oftentimes you weren't the first to find out about it. We learned about it from people who were using data, the data, people who were relying on our data, people who were using our products to rely uh, uh, relying on the data. Um, and there were just so many of those. And we just felt like we entered fire drill mode uh, for the entire week. Um, and we were always sort of proactive, uh, sort of reactive um, around these, these issues. Um, and, you know, in talking with other data teams and other folks um, uh, in, in the data space, it just felt like this was such a common issue. Um, you know, regardless of sort of what role you're in um, and what kind of data you're working with, it feels like, you know, data that's inaccurate or wrong or late um, or sort of, a, you know, someone makes a change somewhere that has an impact downstream that then you're surprised by. All of these sort of changes happen so often, and we're, all, we're often the, the last people to actually find out about it. Um, and so the question is, how do we actually, what is a solution to that, right? I have to believe there is a solution to that. There's no way that we're living in this world and we're all sort of running around trying to solve sort of the latest data problem. Um, and this is where, you know, did the concept of data as observability uh, comes in. And actually, I think the solution to, to this problem starts with looking at our counterparts in software engineering. Um, the good news is that software engineering has actually um, solved similar problems and we can use some corollaries and lessons learned from software engineering to apply to data. So let me explain a little bit more about what I mean. Um, so if you're familiar uh, sort of the concept with um, observability uh, more broadly, this is, you know, some um, uh, principles from, from DevOps uh, for the last couple of decades that have been, um, you know, developed um, and helped actually make sure that some of our favorite things don't break, like Netflix or Slack. Um, and if they do, they're fixed very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, the teams that are responsible for observability in, in applications and infrastructure our, our folks are responsible for building and maintaining and actually fixing things that break down at nearly every company, right? Even if we're not aware of them. Um, and so, you know, I think that solving the problem of sort of bad data can be tackled by relying on some of these best practices. Um, so I'll give you a corollary for this. You know, a couple of decades ago, if, you know, your company website, like, uh, you know, if you had an e-commerce company or, um, you know, if you were sort of running the slack of the times and your website was down, no one noticed. Um, but in today's world, um, if, uh, um, you know, if something like that happens, you know, totally, uh, uh, totally unacceptable and we have all these best practices to make sure that that doesn't happen. How do we create the same, um, the same thing for data, right? And so if you think about DevOps and observability, there's sort of three pillars um, commonly referred to as metrics, traces, and logs. Now, if we wanted to take this concept and apply that to data, what would that actually look like? So we actually defined 
um, the concept of observability and data as an organization's ability to fully understand the health of the data in their system, um, thereby actually eliminating or reducing data downtime. Um, so observability allows us to understand the health of a system by observing the output of that system. And so if we wanted to determine the health of our pipelines, meaning the data that's running in our pipelines, how can we apply the same concept to detect whether the data that we're relying on is actually accurate? And so to do that, we actually define the five pillars of data observability. And we believe that, and what we're seeing in, in, um, in the market is that companies and data teams that are actually very diligent about how, how they think about data observability are able to get a strong view of the health of their data. Now, I'm not talking particularly about the health of the pipelines itself. I'm talking about the health of the data that's running the, running the pipelines, the data that we're actually relying on. We sort of call this the, the good pipelines, bad data problem. Oftentimes we'll have sort of a job that's completed, everything looks fine, but actually the data is you know, all wrong or has been late or is all, has all null values suddenly we're surprised by that. How do you actually uh, detect those issues and be the first to know them? How do you make sure that you are ahead of the game uh, in the sense that when you identify that there's a problem, you can also trace the root cause and identify what led to that problem? How can you quickly answer questions like who's impacted by these problems? Um, who's impacted by this, um, by this data that's stale or inaccurate? So specifically, some of these data, the data observability pillars are um, freshness, which helps us determine whether the data is up to date or not. Um, distribution, what helps us understand at the field level are the values of the data that I'm expecting accurate. Um, a volume, meaning is the amount of data or sort of are the or is the amount of data that I'm um, expecting, um, you know, in line with historical rates. For example, if I'm used to getting, you know, 1 million rows and suddenly I'm getting 5 million or 6 million rows, um, you know, is something wrong. Um, the fourth is schema, which helps us understand the structure of the data. Um, you know, if there's a field that's added or removed or changed in type um, and is often a culprit of data problems. Um, and lineage, which, help, which helps us tie all of this together and answer questions around tracing and root cause and provides context to a problem. So say if a table was typically um, uh, um, updating every three hours and suddenly stops updating, and there's a number of machine learning models that rely on that table, that table probably is very important. Uh, and you want to make sure that um, you know, you're aware of how often it's updated and that it's updated on time. What if there was a table that had no dependencies? Maybe you don't care about that one. In that case, you wouldn't even need to know about, um, about that incident. And so thinking about these five pillars of, the, of observability helps us understand the health of our system and be the first to know about data problems, um, be able to troubleshoot them with, with rich context about them and be able to, to resolve those faster. So what does this actually look in practice? I'll just share a couple of examples of how folks have actually um, used data observability to see, to see real value for their teams. Um, the first example is Yapo. So Yapo has a very strong um, data engineering and BI team. Um, and they, you know, Yapo is a, is a company that works with e-commerce companies to help them drive revenue with things like site reviews, um, just as an example. Um, and you know, they obviously sort of rely on, on data uh, both to make decisions internally, but also to power their, um, to power their products. And so um, as they got um, started implementing data observability, what you can see here is an example of an anomalous data volume detected, um, where you can see the volume sort of pretty steadily over time, and then suddenly a very high um, uh, spike in volume, which helped them identify when there was a real problem. Um, the other thing that was very helpful in this case was actually understanding the relationship between um, schema changes that were happening in one team impacting um, uh, uh, tables and data assets downstream. And by improving the communication around those schema changes, many data disasters were avoided. Um, I'll walk through another example here. Uh, so Blinkist um, is a company um, that uh, it got very uh, serious around um, data, uh, uh, data observability, um, actually as a, as a result of some of the um, COVID-19 um, issues. So um, as you note, um, you may be familiar with Blinkist, 
um, uh, has is an ebook subscription subscription service uh, has over 16 million users worldwide, um, and as part of their growth strategy, actually use performance marketing, paid performance marketing, to fuel their their customer acquisition. Um, and with COVID-19, actually, their 2020 strategy completely changed because historical data could no longer be relied on, um, and they needed to actually use uh, real-time data to optimize some of their campaigns um, and in and use channels like Facebook and Google, um, which would basically auto-optimize based on um, behavioral data. Um, and so, uh, you know, with historical data no longer relevant, they needed to actually implement data observability um, to help make sure that, uh, you know, the quality of their data is, is accurate in real time. Um, and so actually saw faster data incident resolutions and many hours of, of engineering time saved. Um, and looks like I'm up, uh, up with my time here. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'll just wrap up. Um, you know, uh, thinking about data observability starts with kind of setting these baseline expectations about your data. What does actually good data look like? Um, you know, thinking about sort of the five pillars of data observability and how they apply to your business and um, how, the, how the overall view provides a context um, with, along with rich metadata um, about your most critical data assets. Um, and uh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure seeing you all and feel free to reach out if any other questions. Thank you.